All right. Any questions? Yeah, the vertical vertical velocity because the gravitational pull is pulling it down. Right. There's a, a net force in the downward direction, so right. velocity is changing. So if there's acceleration, there's change in velocity. There's no change in the horizontal, right. but there's change in vertical. Yeah, that's that. I'm just struggling with that one. Okay. Other questions? Uh, not according to my calendar. Okay. I've got. Uh, test 1A on Tuesday. Oh, wait, so we have a test banquet? You had a quiz on this past Tuesday. There's the test this coming Tuesday. That's what I've written down. <laughs> have I written it down wrong? It's the test today. No, 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 no. <laughs> no absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are we reviewing today or are we covering more material? I'm going over new material unless you have questions. Okay. I, I'm, okay. I'm not going to free form review. Okay. Does anyone else have questions? Can you tell us what's going to be on it? To like Chapter first? two and three. Look at the old tests. Okay. I mean, that, oh, yeah. That's the best advice. Look at the old tests. So the old test is just the test 1A, right? Not the it would not be 1B. Some of the questions might be on test one, but test one would cover the first two, what is now the first two tests. So if you're looking at a test one, just sort of sift through and go, oh, this deals with forces that, that, that doesn't involve us. So what I do is <clears throat> I have all the tests basically in one part of the folder on the computer. And I close my eyes and I move the cursor up and down and, tell, and then I click. And uh, it usually takes a couple times before I actually click on something. And then, that's, then I go to the test from that semester. I copy that into a new folder for this semester. And then I open up that document. Well, I change the name. Uh, then I open up the document and highlight the whole thing in yellow. So I know what I started with. And then I go through and go, oh, I really like that problem. Let's do that one again, except change numbers. Uh, then I go, and then the next one I might go, oh, that was a really horrible question. I can't believe I asked that. Uh, so I throw that out. And then, ooh, I just thought of a new question. I was watching TV last night and that inspired me. So throw in, and that's how the test ultimately evolved. So you said you did test corrections. How much do they like count back towards the test? All right, so as far as test corrections are concerned, <clears throat> so if you get an A on the test, that's a 4.0. If you get an F on the test, that's a zero. If you decide not to take the test, please, uh, that's a negative 1.0. And so a C is a 2.0. All right, so original score. max with corrections. So if you got a four on it, you can bring it up to a, a 4.3, which is an A plus. If you failed it, you can bring it up to a C. And then that's the scale I set. And you can even set up a graph of original grade, the maximum. And so if this is zero, the maximum could be a two. And if this is a four, so that would be a 4.3, and that in essence is what I do. Now, the way it works, 
it, let's say it is a 150 point test. And you got 75, I gave you credit for 75 with 150 points. And we'll just say that's a C. Then, uh, actually let me check different numbers just so that I'm not, it doesn't look like I'm duplicating myself. All right, so in other words, you missed 80 points. I was like criticizing. <laughs> it's the frustration. As you get more sophisticated phones, you can play, start playing different tunes, even though that's an old one. You can play, start playing different tunes, and I always thought how frustrating it would be because you put up, you have a tune, and you think, all right, this, I love this tune. And then it starts ringing, and you're torn, at least I would be torn between letting the music play or answering the phone. <laughs> Something just seems wrong about stopping it. <laughs> I was not encouraging you to let it go. It's just my own psyche. All right, so you missed 80 points. So on the test corrections, you're trying to convince me that you understand those 80 points that you missed. So one thing, and I'll say it again later, if all you do is write down the correct answer for the test corrections, you'll get no credit whatsoever. There's a higher standard that I'm looking for in the test corrections than on the test. If you write down just the correct answer on the test, I'm going, I figured this person probably knew what they were doing. It's very rarely do I write a problem where a person can luck into the correct answer, although it does happen occasionally. All right. So, uh, so as you do the test corrections and I grade them, and let's say that I give you credit for sixty of the eighty points. There are twenty points where I wasn't convinced you really knew what you were doing. So, you had gotten a two on the original test. The maximum would be a three point one five. In other words, you could have increased your, your grade by 1.15 points on the 4 scale. So I just multiply that fraction times 1.15 plus your original grade. That's what you've been boosted by, and that's what the grade is in the grade book. This, the original grade will be rounded off to you know, uh, an integer plus or minus 0 0.3. Once the test corrections are done, I don't round off. So your final grade might end, whatever that ends up being. I'm going to make up a number here. You know, it might be 2.71. I'm not going to round that off to anything in particular. I guess that would be a B minus. I don't round that to a B or, or I don't round it down to 2.7. That's how test corrections work. And when will they be due after the test? Uh, generally, when I hand them back to you, two weeks from the time I hand them back to you. Oh, we can, we can take them home, correct? The test corrections, yes. The original test, no, you don't get to take that home. No, yeah, I know. Damn. Until I create it. Any other questions at the moment? Um, is the test exactly like the master set? Like, you know how you like. You take the quizzes out of the homework and change the numbers. It's an exact. If you're going to throw the word "exactly" in there, no, and it's not exactly like the master said. I mean, like, look at the old test. You'll notice a pattern. There's certain problems. I mean, other than the fact that I've said there'll be a projectile motion problem on there, but if you look at the old test, you'll notice, wow, every test has a problem like this on it. You can play the odds. So a problem like that will be on the test. There's no more multiple choice. Right? Uh, I'm not a fan of multiple choice. Uh, usually, I don't know, I've been getting away from it over the years. If you look at the earlier tests, there's more multiple choice than the later ones. And I I just, as a student, I didn't like multiple choice. Because very rarely do we have a, do I have a, ever had a teacher who ever gave partial credit for it. Now I do allow, if I do multiple choice, I do allow partial credit if you show your work. But if you just do a random, oh, I like the letter A right now, so let's circle that, then no, you get nothing. No, that's all or nothing to play. All right. Just don't tell Kano. I show my work. All right. <laughs> yeah, 110 students, horrible about showing work. Uh, 251 are excruciating amount of detail and showing their work. And 151, as you would guess, is 
half of you are really good about showing your work and half of you are not, if you're like a typical class. And sometimes people will do a lot of scratch work on a separate sheet of paper. And so it's all over the place. And then sometimes I see people take that scratch work and throw it away. Two issues with that. One, if in doubt, staple it to the test. If I don't look at it, you can always deal with it later. And two, recycle it, it's paper. Don't throw it away. Or compost it. Are you gonna give us like a form sheet or like? The first page is the, are the modulus. <laughs> so if you look at the most recent test that's posted, it probably look almost identical to that. Are we going to use all the formulas? Probably not. <laughs> okay, because it was like 20 some. Yeah, it's, it's all the, basically when I first created the formula sheet, I did a cut and paste from the tops of the quizzes. <clears throat> Other questions? Which chapter are we going over? Field four. Yes. Oh. I'm not sure where four ends and five begins, actually. Yeah, uh, to me, it's all one topic. So I'll probably flip back and forth officially. That's why the master said it's four and five combined. And if we have uh, boxes of stack on top of each other, how do we know which way friction goes? Uh, it should be apparent in the problem which way the thing would want to go. If it, like I had box on box on ground, right. and that was level, so there was no desired movement. Right. So no friction. Okay. okay but okay. in the case of whether there's friction, it should be, it should be obvious. So like with the child sledding, you know, um, yeah. you know that child wants to move forward, so it doesn't well, relative to the sled, he wanted to move backwards, therefore friction was acting forwards on him. Correct. Yeah, so there should be enough information in the problem. Okay. Occasionally there are, I, I do set up a problem, and to me it's quite obvious which way the friction should be acting, and then as I'm grading it, at some point I go, oh, wait a second. You know, I was making the assumption, like there was one where a person was leaning back on a rope, mm -hmm. and the person slammed on the brakes. Well, depending on how far he was leaning back, would affect which way the friction was acting on the person's feet. Right. And so, in a situation like that, it's usually about halfway or maybe three quarters away through grading, then I have to go back and look at every ones that I've already graded just to see. And in those cases like that, I have to give credit both ways, unless I put in language to get rid of one of those solutions. Okay. Other questions? I mean, the process that I went through in class was you have the five basic quantities, the right. displacement, initial final velocities, acceleration and time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is sort of the set up those five things and figure out what do we know, what are we trying to find, mm -hmm. and that dictates which formula to use. Okay. So, or if in doubt, plug into every formula and see which one we can solve. Yeah. That, you know, it's not the most efficient method, but it's better than staring at it and going, I don't know which formula to use. Correct. Try one. If it's the right, the right one, then you'll find out pretty quickly. And projectile motion, I guess I do the same thing, except that right now there's a horizontal or vertical type of that door or something.
Tina, don't tell my friend. No. <laughs> yeah, they'll be posted online at some point. Any questions? Any other questions? And if you want, remind me at the break to, I can grab the, the thing of old tests. I've had students in the past take pictures of every single page. I never got a copy of them, so I can't really pass them on to you. I need, probably this is for your degree by now. All right, we last left off with, what was the last one we did? Okay, and then start talking about facades. Didn't actually solve the problem, I guess. All right, so the basic technique that I'm teaching for, this is chapter four or five, uh, is what I refer to as the facades method. This is not some expression that if you type in facades method in physics, it, you would probably get zero hits on it. Originally, there was only one S, and I thought, great, I have a word. And then I realized I probably should throw in that extra step. That's why there are two S's. So again, force diagram, that's what we spent a lot of time on last week. Force diagram is the F. Acceleration. Direction. Uh, coordinate axes. That's when you're defining the I and J coordinates. I really prefer to use I and J instead of X and Y because most students have been brainwashed into X, Y. And it is usually not convenient to always pick horizontal and vertical, even though the first example we do will be doing that. But oftentimes it's convenient to you know, tip it over like a little teapot. Darn straight. Decompose, this is when we're breaking a vector up into its components. Equations of motion. And even though the word motion is in there, this is not a reference to the, to, to the equations from chapters two and three, but a reference to force is equal to mass times acceleration. Then substitution. Solve. <clears throat> F equals MA. Let's talk a little bit about that. And let's see if there's a marker that will write darker than that. Why do you use this? And we're not out of these quite yet. Oh. All right, so let's make sure we understand what the letters represent. Force. What force? Normal force. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Motion. Pardon? Motion. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. An object can be moving without having forces acting on it. Weight. Not necessarily. Let's just take Ben for example. Hope you don't mind. All right. From our point of view, I'm not worrying about you know just subtle movements. But from our point of view, is he accelerating? So you're saying no. Yeah. You're not sure. Define our point of view. From our point of view. You standing right there. You are you sitting right there, my standing right here, is been accelerating. No. So you're more confident. Yeah. Alright, Brandon, do you want have you have confidence now? Yeah. It's no. It's no. Alright. What about this side of the room? Anyone on this side of the room want to comment on whether he's accelerating or not? Mm -hmm. 
He's not accelerating from our point of view. All right. Nothing with confidence. All right. Anyone from the back of the room? No. All right. So if acceleration is zero, the force is zero? What does that mean, the force is zero? What force is zero? The observable force. What is, which one is that? <laughs> Do you have any forces acting on you? No, pointing. That's not a force. Pardon? Gravitational Thank you. All right. I, I would assume he has a gravitational force acting on him. Now, if he's a figment of all our imaginations, then all this is out the window. But let's assume that he is actually a real boy or a young man, whatever it is at this point. <laughs> Suddenly, Pinocchio references are running through my head. <laughs> All right, so is his weight zero? No. But we are convinced there's weight acting on him. Yes. All right, any other forces acting on Ben? Upward force of the chair. And, and what do we call that? Normal force. Normal force. Is the normal force zero? No. No. Thank you. That's what this F represents. This is the net or total force. Now we don't write that. Sometimes I will put a little subscript COT or, T, or write out total or net or something like that, but it's supposed to be understood that this force in F equals MA is the total force. <clears throat> so based on chapters, or primarily chapter two, What's the formula for acceleration? So if the acceleration is zero, what's the total force? Zero. Yeah, that's what we just talked about. If, it, if the acceleration is zero, the total force is zero. What else must also be zero? If acceleration is zero, what else must also be true? Close. Unless I didn't hear part of what you said. Did you just say velocity? Okay, then I'll go back to it. close. Average velocity? No. Change velocity. Yes, change, change in velocity. This is why I said earlier that an object can be moving without any forces acting on them because the total force is zero means there's no change in velocity. It doesn't mean there's no velocity. <clears throat> Matter of fact, we could go start with any of them. I started with acceleration, but if the change in velocity is zero, acceleration is zero, and therefore force is zero. Or if force is zero, then acceleration is zero, which means the change in velocity is zero. In other words, if one of these is true, all three are true. If any of these are true, this is known as equilibrium. There are two types, static and dynamic. Static equilibrium is an object's in equilibrium and not moving relative to the observer. Dynamic, in equilibrium and moving. So there's static and dynamic. So here, velocity equals zero. And here, the velocity does not equal zero. Is the velocity equal zero or the change in velocity? Oh, never mind, it's velocity. Yeah. Change in equilibrium, we know change in velocity is zero, but static velocity is zero. Static equilibrium. So this brings up the question in my mind of what's velocity? Displacement over time? Changes. Uh, yes, I'm looking for more of a conceptual definition of velocity. Changing, changing of magnitude of direction. Changing magnitude of direction. Of what? Speed. It's speed in a direction. Yeah, that's more of what I was going for. Oh, okay. It, it, change, once you, uh, once you say change to me, it's a math formula. 
oh. it would be change in the magnitude of the position or the direction of the position. Okay. All right, so speed in a particular direction. So if acceleration is zero, what can you tell me about the speed and direction of the object's movement? Cannot change. All right, or constants, that's what you said. All right, so if this is true, speed and direction of movement do not change. <clears throat> Most of you have heard this before. Let me give the more common version. An object at rest will stay at rest, an object in motion will stay in motion in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted on by an outside force. Should be a net outside force. This, the thing that I just sort of monotoned through, it's Newton's first law of motion. Now, I don't know why he decided to have two laws of motion where the first one was just the wording of the second one. Matter of fact, the second one does, gives more detail. But the first law of motion officially is an object will keep doing what it wants to do unless something forces it to change. Now, there was a textbook that at least one of you is familiar with that described uh, this, this idea of, uh, let me back up, lead into it. This idea that things want to keep doing what they are doing is called inertia. And thus my daughter, my baby girl, she's 21, so old. We, my, when she was growing up, my wife and I called her Inertia Girl. But why we called her Inertia Girl is that if we needed to go to the store when she was really young, she'd be playing in the living room. We want to go to the grocery store, and so she has to go with us because we can't just leave her in the house for the dogs to raise. She doesn't want to go. So we managed to force her into the car. We get to the store. She doesn't want to get out of the car. We get her into the store. It's time to go. She doesn't want to leave the store. We force her back into the car, get home. She doesn't want to get out of the car and go back into the house. Whatever she was doing, she wanted to keep doing. That's inertia. In order to change what you are doing, in order to change the speed or direction, you must have some outside, some total net, non-zero net outside external force that causes you to change. <clears throat> so, there was a textbook that some of you are perhaps familiar with, which called inertia laziness. Now, the question I have is, why is inertia not laziness? Why is that a horrible definition for it? Because it's staying in motion, it's going to stay in motion, which is not really lazy. Uh, the example I usually give is digging a latrine hole. If you're digging a latrine hole, laziness means you want to stop digging as much as, as soon as possible. Inertia means you want to keep digging as long as, and once you start. Now, getting you to start is difficult, but once you start, you won't, don't want to stop. So sometimes Newton's first law of motion is just called the law of inertia. Sorry, law of inertia. It's the same as Newton's first law, that's N1L. My predecessor used that abbreviations, those abbreviations. I like it. This is NTL. There's a third law of motion, which we actually have used already. There is really what's going on, and then there's the more popular version of it, which is just completely misleading. <clears throat> I'm gonna do really what's going on, and then I'm gonna do, probably with a snotty accent, or a snotty tone, give you the more common version of it. For every force, that object A, that object A exerts, exerts on object B, B 
B will exert a force on A, which has the same magnitude but opposite direction. Markers fading as we go. But opposite direction. as the force A exerts on B. <clears throat> and we did this when we were doing the force diagrams to say forces always come in pairs. The objects of the, the, the force upon which the force acts are different objects. So we talked about a force acting on B and a force acting on A. We always drew them so they were in opposite directions, whether they're pointing towards each other or away from each other. We used the same letter to represent them because they had the same magnitude. I can write that more briefly. This is the math version of the exact same thing. The force on A from B is equal to the negative of the force on B from A. So this notation right here, this is the force on A from B. We will take advantage of this when we start in chapter seven. What is the more common, really horrible way of expressing Newton's third law? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. Ugh. I heard justification for mass, uh, mass homicide by Newton's third law once. Because the person had been oppressed for so long and picked on and, and beaten for so long that his reaction would have been equal and opposite. So his committing mass murder was justified. Now in that particular case, you, might, you could make an argument actually for his reaction. However, Newton's third law is not the justification. Years ago, I was looking for a video to demonstrate Newton's third law, and I came across one that was put on by some middle schoolers, as best as I could tell. Could be ninth graders, at, you know, at some point, I can't tell. And they went to a bowling alley, and they had this bowling ball being returned, and it came up, there's a bowling ball sitting here, the other bowling ball returns, comes up, hits this one, and this one moves on. And in their obnoxiously giggly voice, uh, said, the action is, this ball hit that one. The reaction is, this ball moved that way. No, the action is this ball put a force on that ball. The reaction is this ball put a force back on that one. This ball stopped because there's a force pushing back on it. 